Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to a very special edition of the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. And since this is a special edition, we always bring in a special guest host. And we had to go to the family here at 607 Podcast. You know him as the host of the 3FN Podcast and 607 TWS, the wrestling show. Rich is joining us today. What's up, ODPH Society? Always glad to be here, especially for these awesome special occasions. Absolutely. And why is it so special? Last year, comic book fans were treated to an amazing line of books coming out via Best Jacket Press on the Comicsology Originals line. So last October, we were greeted to We Have Demons by with the phenomenal artwork for Greg Capullo, Clear with amazing visuals from Francis Manipal, and the modern vintage horror story Night of the Ghoul with Francisco Francavilla on the artwork. All three are amazing books and have generated so much of a buzz. Now, the second wave of books on this line have come out. The breathtaking Barnstormers with artwork from Tula Lotte. The modern or the horror western that is becoming a modern classic, in my opinion, with artwork from Dan Panderson. And the all ages amazing book that has just started out. Dudley Datsun and the Forever Machine with artwork from Jamal Eigel. We have so much to talk about these books, but I figured we have to bring in a guest that can talk about them a little bit more than I can. You know his work from such books as Noctera, Undiscovered Country, American Vampire, Witches, Batman, the list goes on and on. We are so very fortunate that he has graced us with some time today to talk about these books. Ladies and gentlemen of the ODPH Society, Please give a warm welcome to the one and only Scott Snyder. Scott, thank you for joining us today. No, thanks so much for having me, man. I've been looking forward to it. Thanks for everything you guys do. Oh, thank you so much. We appreciate all the kind words. But let's talk about the books now. It's been one year since Scotttober was unveiled. And these three books obviously came out with a lot of hype behind them. And rightfully so. They all stand on their own with We Have Demons, Clear, and Night of the Ghoul. How how would you describe the journey from then to now? Oh man, I mean that's a great question. It's been it's been wild. I mean I think, you know, uh, when you sign up for something like this that that you know co- Comicsology was so generous to us about giving us kind of all this breadth and giving us kind of eight books to try and and the fun for me when we signed up for it was twofold. You know, one was the creative liberties that they were promising us, um, the ability to kind of do the books that we had um, that we had uh, pitched to them without any real um, you know without any real constraints, so that it could be a real partnership between me and each co-creator to make something that we wouldn't be able to make elsewhere or on our own or any of that. And then the second part of it was trying to get behind you know a, a kind of delivery system that we believed in at a time when comics were really struggling with the pandemic. Um, and I think a lot of the weaknesses and some of the underlying fragility of the of the the whole kind of market was was showing, and so it was about well, how do we make all these books and then make them in a way that would be really affordable for fans, so they don't cannibalize each other and also point towards you know one possible lane that comics can drive in in the future that maybe will strengthen the industry um, by virtue of, of it having alternatives to just simply uh, simply a competitive uh, digital and print space. Um, for me, I think one of the big mistakes that comics has made over the last 10 years since, you know, I was the new 52 when we started doing day and date mm. um, digital releases is that we've kept digital um, in a sort of relegated to a space where price has to be the same the contents has to be exactly the same the date has to be the same you know whereas all these other industries tv i mean manga all these other places have subscription-based streaming services where you can essentially browse you know uh, for a subscription and then get the physical of the thing that you want with all kinds of collectability attached so the fun for us was to be able to do something that would give us again a lot of creative elasticity and make books that 
you know, we're, we were, per, were personal to us and we were passionate about and would allow us to try new things artistically. Um, and then also something that from a business standpoint, we believed in as a kind of forward thinking mission, you know, forward thinking project. So that's really like the whole purpose of doing it. And then a year later now, it's sort of worked out better than I had hoped where, you know, the books, the books were a joy, the first wave, you know, getting to work creator owned with people that I've really only gotten to work, um, you know, uh, in licensed material with from Greg Capullo, Jamal, I'm, I mean, um, Francesco Francabilla and uh, Francis Manipal, who I've done a lot of DC stuff with, but I haven't had a chance to just kind of make stuff together from the ground up with. It was just such a joy and all of us were left wanting to do more. So I'm already talking to Francis and I have another another sort of book lined up that we're going to be doing. Craig and I are, you know, we're, we really got bit by the bug and can't wait to do more. We have Demons or another book that he, he pitched as well after doing some, um, you know, after he does Creech and does um, the Batman Spawn crossover and that stuff. So, um, and he might, you know, depending when, um, but we're, we're definitely going to come back to it in that way. So, and Francesco and I, again, we're already talking about when his schedule frees up. So it's been a blast. And this second wave, the first wave of books, I, so I could just keep talking forever. <laughs> no, I go right ahead. No, absolutely. The, the first wave of books was almost like, let me do the things that I normally do with these creators, but in a kind of a totally unchained way where we're making stuff that speaks to the kind of things that we did together, you know, um, at DC, but is just no holds barred our stuff that we're doing from, from scratch. And so We Have Demons has all the sensibilities of like metal and Batman. It's about a young girl who discovers that her father was part of a demon hunting organization and that she's kind of cast right into the middle of this like millennia old war between good and evil. And, you know, Francis and I did a lot of justice league and, and that has a lot of cosmic um, and sci-fi elements and clear is a uh, uh, noir that takes place in a sci-fi future where everybody connects to the internet neurologically and so skins the world however they want. And so even though the superstructure stays the same, if you want to look out and see like 1940s noir, you know, glam setting, you see that or zombie apocalypse setting, you see that and so on. And it's a murder mystery that takes place in that world. So again, it has kind of echoes at least of some of the stuff that we, we did at DC. And then Francesco and I, we've done tons of dark horror stuff at DC between Black Mirror and little projects on Swamp Thing and things over the years. So Night of the Ghoul is about like the greatest classic horror movie that was lost in a studio fire is fictionalized obviously but um and it's about a guy who tracks down the director of that movie and and discovers that the monster in that movie might not only be real but might be haunting the building that he's interviewing the guy in so again like those three books have kind of the i think the priorities of the work that i did with those those creators at dc but done on our own terms and the second wave barnstormers canary and dudley dotson are with people I've never gotten to work with extensively, but who I've been uh, fan, a fan of and who I've been friends with now for a number of years. So this wave is more experimental and a little bit more kind of like, let's try some stuff both creatively and, um, you know, what will creatively that, that, that um, pushes the envelope for me at least as a writer and takes me out of my comfort zone and allows them to really shine. And so Barnstormers is a historical uh, adventure story about a guy who's a supposedly a World War One pilot who comes back and is barnstorming around the country and picks up this really unlikely passenger and this runaway bride and the two of them have this big crime spree adventure um, and it's kind of about you know how 100 years ago the 1920s weren't that different than this period and then Canary um, this this really dark kind of horror western that I'm doing with Dan Panosian is like probably the most experimental of all the books. And yet at the same time, I'm, I think we're, I really think we're hitting it where it's like, it's a, it's a Western, but it's about a Western that sort of addresses all the stuff that, um, you know, I think we're all the anxieties of this particular moment in time, but in done in a very brutal, vicious mm. kind of way, but still that adheres to the genre elements of a Western 
from back then, but it gets bigger and, and weirder, almost true detective style as it goes in this, in this really, um, <laughs> in this way that's pretty ambitious. Uh, and uh, I think Dan is, if I, you know, Dan is just, if I didn't have somebody as skilled as Dan on it, I'd be scared to try it, but I love it. And then I've never done an all ages book. And then Jamal and I both have kids that um, are really interested in doing comics. So we decided to do this and kind of get their advice and, do an all ages cosmic adventure with Dudley Dotson. And so, again, these are genres that I haven't really worked in in comics uh, predominantly. Um, and so uh, there are projects that push me a little more or you know, kind of a bit more vanguard for me creatively than, than I've, I've been in the past, I think. So it's great. I mean, I just, I love it. Like comicsology couldn't have been kinder to us and more supportive and, you know, it's a great way of making books where we own the rights together, me and the co-creator. So I'm going out with Night of the Ghoul next week, which is the first one of the bunch that we're taking out for TV film. Oh, nice. So, yeah, we'll see. I'm really excited. You know, you never know. But it's always fun to to have something with a friend of yours that you, you own together that you're going to kind of go out there and and see what people think of. So yeah, it should be good. That's like everything in a nutshell, I think, right? Yeah, pretty much. I was going to say that covers the whole line. And especially for looking from then to now, I mean, I always say the move is so game changing that when you left and announced this was coming out, this is all creator owned. This is all going to be a different vibe than what we've seen. I mean, I always kind of refer to it as like when the big seven left Marvel originally to form image, but to like a, a little lesser scale is just you're coming in. Obviously, everybody knows your previous work. You have a very big fan base about this. And now you get the chance to really go all in about whatever stories you want to go with. And they've been, you know, obviously such a creative freedom you can see in when you're reading them. And then now with the second wave, it can definitely go into some different directions that I think is just coming off so well to the fan base. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. You know, it, I think like I've been doing this teaching over at Substack that I really... I've been really enjoying, you know, I thought I'd like it, but I was nervous because I haven't taught in a couple of years and, and doing it in this format where you're um, doing it over zoom with a massive audience and not face to face or any of that stuff was intimidating, but it's wound up being like the real, a real highlight of the month, every month for me. And I look forward to it tremendously. And we have a bigger class tonight <laughs> than what I expected be a couple thousand people in the, in it. Um, but the two rules of that class that um, I really have always used in for maybe 15 years of teaching, you know, ever since I was like an adjunct in my twenties um, uh, are one, you have to write the story that you would love to find that day on the rack. You mm -hmm. know, it doesn't matter what it is, but it has to be the one that you would, would be your favorite. And then the second rule is you have to always try and be the most exciting writer to yourself um as you can be and so those those that's sort of the double helix of the whole class um and uh for me like you were saying i mean i think the thing i well i think i love about teaching is like it keeps you honest you know yeah. i can't go out here and like preach all that and then come home and be a total hypocrite about it and be like i'm gonna phone it in <laughs> right so, right so here i'm trying that i'm trying really hard to just be able to put my money where my mouth is. And um, again, I think the fun thing is I, I really believe in the, in the kind of delivery system that we're offering with, with Comixology. I mean, at about this point right now, if you were to get a subscription to Comixology Unlimited, or if you already have Prime, it, you can get all of them anyway. So, and if I was, if I didn't believe in this, I'd be shilling for you to buy every single issue individually. Cause you know, ultimately it would, it would, probably make us more money that way but the reason that we did it was to to say like look this is one alternative to just strict direct market um and we were really scared like what if we do this and it winds up hurting the direct market what if we do it and it doesn't work and but i thought it would and then luckily the numbers our first book out from um dark horse because all the books come out in print six months after they're out in digital um, we have demons. We wound up, you know, approximating the numbers that Greg and I normally do on Batman and that stuff where it was above 90,000. Oh, nice. The first issue, you know, and it had been out for six months digitally and we offered new stuff in the print. It was like the script and the designs and it's oversized and really beautiful sort of job on Dark Horse's part, like typical of them to sort of repackage and make sure that it's, you know, something special in the physical that you want. So, yeah, it's just one, it's like one 
it's not this is the future of comics and everybody should do it this way mm -hmm. it's more like look this is right now is a really transformative time i think in comics mm -hmm. it's a really it's an exciting time where more creators are taking control of their careers than ever before because there are all these different avenues suddenly with new publishers many more than were there 10 years ago from vault and boom and scout and awa and kickstarter you can do and you know everything um but it's also a really scary time where i think there isn't a lot of there isn't a lot of like um sort of prescribed wisdom about this is this is the way it'll work you know everyone is kind of searching for what works for them individually and what they believe in as kind of a uh uh, a pillar of what will hold the comics industry in a stronger position, I think, down the way. So, yeah, so this way, luckily, it's been working out really well. And I'm excited just in the process of signing up to do some more books with them in 2023 and and also still have some stuff in the direct market. So I'm going to have a couple books like Noctera, Bring Witches Back, and then possibly one other one that we're going to do straight, straight to print first, you know, and really okay. go big and bombastic with. And then and then have these as a way of really um, being creative and, and again, like trying things that that we can do without those books necessarily kind of competing with themselves or with each other in, um, you know, direct market. Because there's only so much room, right? I mean, like, that's one of my big issues, honestly, with the direct market right now that I think is just, I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but just the price. I mean, yeah. my kids are comic fans and it's very hard to see them go in and give them their allowance and then have them go in and every comic is four to five dollars, you know? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I, I always like, I love, I love when the comics are, you know, doing metal and all that stuff. We always wanted to make it like much more than your money's worth. We're trying really hard to just stuff it. So you'd be like, wow, I got more than I paid for. But you know, a lot of the comics that method doesn't necessarily work for a book like Canary or Barnstormers that needs more, breathing room and so in that way it's like do i even feel ethical about saying to get all my books you're gonna have to be winding up paying you know twenty dollars a month like every month mm -hmm. it's for me like it's a lot for especially young people so i don't know i'm excited about this this i'm trying different things you know what i'm saying yeah like, absolutely like, and, and it yeah. And I, I think that's something, too, that this is so forward thinking, obviously, reading the temp in the room and how much digital has now become such a, a a normalcy for comic fans, too, that obviously going through Comixology, it's a way that if you're a subscriber, you can read the books first. But then it's also there's no feeling like going to a comic shop on New Comic Book Day, picking it up, talking with the fellow fans there and just owning the physical copy, too. That I think this way is just a, is it's a perfect way to appease everybody because if you read it on Comicsology and you're really that in love with the books, like for me, I, when I read we we have demons, I'm going out and buying those issues as I'm going to go buy the trade paperback when it comes out this week because for yeah, me, right. oh sorry, yeah no exactly and the, the, exactly like the trade pa the paperback is coming out you know and and that has all this extra stuff in it. It's got all the variant covers, it's got the script, it's got a note from me about why we're doing it, it's got Craig's designs for the. And it's meant to be something that you can hold and take home. Like, I just see my kids, you know, I mean, I, I can only kind of go off what they do. And I've got like a whole range, you know, we have like the 15 year old, the 11 year old, and now three year old, hmm. which surprise, you know, it's yeah. wonderful. You know, I was like doing the math in my head of like, this kid is going to go to high school, go to college in 2037. And I'm like, I'm definitely going to need a flying car to take me to that one, you know, but the, <laughs> the, the, um, the 15 year old and 11 year old, they both consume everything, whether it's music, you know, or TV or reading materials from Webtoons and, and Shonen Jump and Crunchyroll and like everything they read. And uh, like even Amazon stuff, they read on Kindle and they read Aud Audible. Everything is subscription based. And then when they like something, they're, they want to go to the store. They're constantly going to the comic store with me um, to get the collections of the things that they want. Or, if they read something by somebody and then they really heard great things about something else, sometimes they'll go to buy the physical of the thing that they know is like the classic, you know, like for example, they were reading, we were going over um, uh, with my 15 year old who's, we're doing a comic together now actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, we're gonna kind of announce it and just sort of soft pedal it a little bit in the in the late fall but i'm really excited about it he he this it was our summer project because he was really interested and i was like if you want to do it i'll do it with you and show you how to do it but you got to do it you right know? 
And so anyway, like, the, but the point is, um, you know, we've been looking at stuff like um, everything, like, you know, Frank Miller and Mark Millar, a lot of stuff that I came up on just to, sh to show him different story structure. And he'll, he'll read stuff digitally and then be like, this one looks like, you know, I want, I want the volume of Kick-Ass. I want the whole thing. So the store, you know. And so we wind up, I think, spending, honestly, probably more at the store than we, we had before based on his immersion in comics, you know, through, through digital. So that's my hope is that we can get used to a model that at least embraces that as a faction of comic consumption, not necessarily the totality where, you know, that becomes the norm. But having it as an option, I think, is a really welcoming kind of pathway for especially young readers to feel like, oh, like all these other medium that I consume, you know, I can or I buy things in. I can just browse thousands of comics and then decide what I like and then go to the store for the culture of the store, for the collectability of the physical, for the community of it, the whole thing, you know, because I mean, like the truth is when I was a kid, I still I got my comics through subscription because we lived up in upstate New York. And then when we moved to the city, I just kind of kept them going and that stuff. My dad was in the Air Force and then he was in med school when I was growing up. And, you know, until I was about 10 or 11, we didn't have a comic store um and so even then i kept my subscription to my dc stuff my marvel stuff so i would get it in the mail but i still like loved going to the comic store to go talk to everybody and then find other stuff and we went every wednesday to forbidden planet like the old one on 11th street okay um, in, Broadway, in new york so there's always my point is simply there's always a way to bypass the store you know it's always been like a part of the culture whether you could order them in the mail or and digital whatever it is but i mean my stores the two stores by me that i really frequent fourth world and red shirt um are, are thriving like they're in indie stuff because of kind of the the i think the pandemic kind of making people rediscover their love of their hobbies growing up because of the statues and the collectability and the toys and all of it but you know, it's that. It's like turning yourself books to for people you're welcoming and you have a geek culture there. So, I don't know. That's my feeling about it, you know? No, I can definitely understand that, too. I mean, especially, like, for me, that's how I've always grown up is just going to the comic shop, and that's what I've done. And so kind of walking into this whole digital era has been something very new to me. I, like, I know Pad's pretty much familiar because this is the area he's grown up in. Yeah, I mean, just for me, Comicsology has been such a welcome, uh, you know, avenue to to get comics because as somebody, you know, and I'm sure a lot of listeners can relate to this. You know, you got a job, you got your home life, family life, and and just you know, not a lot of jobs are nine to five anymore. You mm -hmm. know, it, it's whenever they need you. So some folks still, yeah, you work that nine to five, but then there's some folks who work, you know. 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. Or, or whatever else it is. So, like, you don't have that time to get to the comic shop just because they close at a certain time. So, hey, you know, I'm not able to get to the comic shop. And when I am, my favorite books that I wanted to get are all sold out, unfortunately. You know, so yeah. Comixology has been that awesome addition where, you know, hey, I'm not able to make it. I can get on there and I can get my favorite books and I can support my favorite authors. Yeah, and I just think I think that's great. And I think, you know, there's a there's a space for each. You know, for me, digital is like immersive and immediate and kind of browsy and breezy like that and then collectible is like this is what we're doing with our stuff like you know a lot of it a lot of it is new to the to the process with comiXology and and i'm excited that they allowed us to do it but their deal with dark horse wasn't even solidified when we when we um started talking to them and in 2019 into 2020 and for me, the whole goal was like, if I'm really leaving DC and I'm staying out off, like off Marvel and DC for a little bit, then I want to be able to do something that I feel is comprehensive, both creatively, but also industry wise, like that I believe in and that I can, I don't, I'm not, you know, like I didn't, I don't come up with like Scott Tober and that stuff, but the same way, like DC, if you want to, you know, you want, you want me to shave my head and do a Mohawk and play, you know, like go out there with Greg for metal. If I love the book and I believe in the book and I believe in the support you're giving us, then I'll be your dancing bear, no problem. Like I'm, I'm always happy to go out there and chill for stuff that I'm proud of. You know, and I don't mind embarrassing myself for that because I stand by the, I stand by what we made. So with Comicsology, it was the same where it was like, look, I mean, if you guys, if we don't do this, or if, if it really is like 
a fuck up in some way. I'm the one out there with my name being like, you know, I could easily do the books very quietly and just be like, hey, we're doing books over here, not promote it as, as this Scott Tober, you know, partnership with them. And instead just make the books, you know, plenty of people, big creators are doing books over there, like Jeff Lemire and a lot of people. And, you know, you make the books and you have a couple books lined up and, you know, you're just making them. But I wanted to go out there when they offered it and said, listen, we'd like to partner and be like, what if, you know, you, you're, you know, a, a big sort of, uh, face of this thing. Um, and I, that the reason that I believed in it was because they, they said like, look with dark horse, we're partnering with dark horse. The books will come out in print. It's not digital only. And then when they come out in print, we'll do single issues for the first time. So with, with books that fit that. So with, with some books, like, um, initially I was like, I don't know if like we have demons, we have demons. I knew was like, Greg, Greg and I have a big direct market presence. Right. So the fun was like, I can't, I don't want to do that one. It's just a trade. Not even because for the money, we don't, just to be clear, like they gave us big advance, sort of advances on the page rates for the artists and that stuff. So it's very unlikely that we make back enough to make money um, on the other, on the back end from royalties and that stuff for, for quite a while. Okay. So there's no big incentive for me to be like, I want to do it so that I make a ton of money doing single issues because I don't, I don't make anything from that. But the idea was to do something where retailers wouldn't feel skipped over and just given a trade by a, a team that has a, a relatively big footprint in, you know, in the direct market. So the whole fun was like, if you guys are willing to do single issues with variant covers and ratios and the whole thing, we'll hit harder than direct market on the other side. Um, and then some of the books that maybe aren't as, aren't as direct market friendly or is a little bit more experimental, if you want to do trade, that's great. But let's, let's try and make each thing special to each book. And they were really cool about that. And, um, you know, the first three books did well enough that they, they want to do single issues with all three. So Night of the Bull, you know, the FOC for that is like coming up in a few weeks. But um, and we did single issue with, like I said, with We Have Demons and we're really happy with it. So, yeah, it's each thing. It's kind of like each thing is its own project. And the idea of being able to say there's a way that these things can help each other, like you were saying, you know, if I can't get to the store, I, I still don't want to be like shit. I have to pay four ninety nine, so now I'm not going to buy the comic. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If I buy it digital and it's four ninety nine, that's my budget for that comic or that series. But if I can go browse it for free, and be or for free or for the price of whatever I paid, right. you know, for the monthly subscription, then I'm like ten times as likely to then go to the store at my leisure when I can and pick up the collection or pick up the, pick up the especially if the single issue has extra stuff in it, maybe pick up the single issue, especially if it's a number one or it's whatever, or pick something else up by that creative team, you know? So it's like that. It's like the more money you ha let me spend in the store by being able to kind of browse and see what I like online, the more money I'm going to spend, especially as a parent, you know, with kids that love, suddenly want the toys and want everything. So it's a, it's a really, I don't know, man, it's a really fascinating time, I think. Like, Again, you know, I'm 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 here saying like, if I screw up with it, I'm I'm listening, you know. But I'm really happy with how it's gone, and um, people seem to be responding really well to the to the to the whole idea, you know. And it's it's certainly like there are hiccups all the time. Like I know Comicsology when they did their interface, there's a lot of um, sort of difficulty in terms of it the 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 experience being as good as it was before and i know they're they, they're constantly you know talking about how they're working on it and all that stuff and and i totally understand that kind of frustration on readers part and and the worry that you know your old thing is going to be absorbed into this big company amazon and all right that. but the the ultimately like the thing that i walk away with is the same thing we've been talking about which is the people at comiXology that i know like amazon acquired comiXology comiXology is you know, thriving as a as a space within that, and the people there are comic people. It's Bryce and and Kiwi, and you know, all the people that work there are from comics. Like, and and they want comics to thrive, and so you know, they're committed to both helping fix the you know the the reading experience, but also being part of a community that 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 thrives on all levels. So, like, that's why I feel like they support you know, all these cons and artist alleys and all that. I'm going to Thought Bubble in November and it's sponsored by Comixology, the whole convention, you know, which I didn't even know. Oh yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah, so it's just like, I just think, I love that they're a good player in that way. And I and I, I like, 
I like what we've been able to do with them in that way. And I'm coming out of DC. I'm interested. I'm I'm, tr- I'm trying to. I don't know, man. Just think of myself more as part of an ecosystem in comics and not, you know, not just within that kind of constrained stuff. Like when you're at DC and you're doing an event, like it's the whole quarter, two quarters maybe depend on that thing. Hmm. So people's jobs depend on it. You know, people's, the, the company's health as a, as a company owned by a larger megalodon that's like looking at it, yeah. you know, like <laughs> all of that stuff. And so that pressure, I, I thrive in that environment and I like it, you know, it's like the world series, you know, and you're like, let's do this. But it's very also like, it's a very particular math. It's like a math that's all about how do I make this event personal and something I'm passionate about what it's saying. And yet at the same time, lift all boats so that all fans, everybody is like, I have to read that thing because it's so nuts. And so like, what the hell are they doing over there like that? And so being in that for so long, I think coming out of it, the fun is being like, well, how do I stop thinking in those terms that are so about how do I do something I care about and then help the company I'm at that way. And instead of think of the industry a little more holistically and say, how do I be a, a good part of this whole thing? How do I do something that I'm proud of and I can sleep well at night being like, I believe in what we're doing and I'm thinking more broadly about, you know, the industry as a whole, as opposed to like DC and the health of this company and that it, you know, so I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. One of the things that uh, I also enjoy is not only I, I'm not just, uh, you know, I just don't read comics. I collect them, not not in the sense that I get them graded and I'm worried about that, but it's something cool that I can pass down to my, you know, my son and everything else. And it's, it's pretty awesome. And the nice part about Comicsology is I get to read everything. I don't have to worry about, you know, ruining the book or, you know, jumping a glass of water on it or buying two different books. And that's really nice. And then also when you pointed out when you go to paper, you know, you're going the trade paperback route. Uh, with putting out, you know, we have demons and having all the extra. That's awesome for a collector because I've read the book. I got to digest it. I can look at the extras and then I can put it away. And it's, it's something that will stand uh, later on. So I think that's just super awesome. And it's it's great for that avenue. Thanks. Yeah, you know, and I, I think the, the other thing is like the the idea of, of separating it that way so that you have collectability be the direct market side of it is again like i'm excited about the possibilities you know we're talking about all kinds of new stuff like with dark horse also like special exclusive signed stuff that drop like trying to follow a model that if you want to be if you, you you can you can buy in at whatever level you want right so like if you want to just get the cl- collection because you liked reading it digitally you can do that but if you are a speculator or somebody who really enjoys you know especially in these days because we uh, we were saying before we jumped on like baseball and the Yankees and the whole the whole world feels like they're back into sort of speculation and gambling and yeah. <laughs> like that <laughs> and, and the F and sports kings and like every, I mean like you see it everywhere everybody's gambling you know but that idea of like if you do want that buy in then you can do something where we're going to release like one of a hundred covers that's signed by, you know, me and Greg for We Have Demons or merch that you can only get like for 24 hours, like, you know, statue that we designed or so we're, we're getting into that idea of like that option. If you want that stuff, if you don't, you, there's no reason, there's no push that you have to buy it. There's no pressure the way there is on retailers sometime. Like you get the special variant. If you order 50 copies, it's just, it's more like, look, if you want to order this, you have this window and it costs this and it's up to you, you know, and it's totally optional. So all of it is like trying to figure a way to both give you the level of, give you different comfort levels and wherever you are, there's one for you. Like if you want to just, you can read all six books that I've been doing at Comixology for the price of one comic, like right now, you know, a month, like, or Prime, if you already have it and you have access, you can just go browse all of it. And we have two more coming out. One of them they're going to announce in a minute um, in terms of we've announced all what the titles are, but when the release date is for New York, but Book of Evil is coming and then Tuck and Cover, which are with, you know, longtime creative partners, Jock and Raphael Albuquerque. Oh, nice. And Book of Evil is this one that I've been working on a while where it's like it's about a future where 92 percent of the world's population are suddenly born sociopaths and nobody knows why and it takes place like 20 years after this and 
And uh, it's really dark and fun. It's kind of like Stand By Me about these kids growing up in this world um, and what it's like. And, and, and then the other one is uh, uh, Duck and Cover is, is the idea that um, Rafa and I talked about way back when, um, like just a few years ago, but when we were finishing American Vampire about doing where it's like, uh, what if the United States and Russia have this nuclear exchange in the 50s and kind of obliterate each other and the only people that survive are kids that hit under their desks like in those old PSAs and nobody knows why. And so it begins in this kind of 1950s rockabilly post-apocalyptic adventure. Wow, thing. that sounds awesome. Yeah, it's super fun. And so the idea the idea is like that wave is kind of going back to like, you know, if this wave is a little more experimental and trying trying things maybe, you know, that, that push me a little more outside my comfort zone creatively that's kind of coming back and giving you big over the top comfort food in a different way even though um they have some creative experimentation like uh book of evil is mostly prose it's like it looks like the book you found though you found it and it was written by this kid there so um anyway the the yeah we got i mean we got we got a lot coming i'm really i'm really i don't know i'm really happy with all of it i feel really good i mean i still get tempted now and then you know you get you talk to marie at dc or cb at marvel and you know every once in a while i look over and i'm like oh man you know like i had an idea for wolverine or oh, i have an idea of how to how to kind of surprise people in the dc universe but it's been it's been such a good time doing this and and just kind of making stuff on your own you know and not worrying about some of that arithmetic that, that's there internally at the company that um I don't know. I'm not rushing to go back at this point. I will. It's, I'm sure at some point go back to Marvel and DC, but right now I'm just kind of enjoying myself too much. No, and it, and that comes through the writing too. Like I say, when I'm reading this as a fan, like I can definitely tell how much fun you're having, and just it doesn't feel like there's a lot of pressure on this. It's just this is a labor of love, and you get to hang out with some of your friends and get to do some really cool stuff. That's how it feels. You know what I mean? Like I just. I don't feel, I, I feel really liberated to just try different things creatively and I have more work than I've ever had, but I feel less stressed than I've ever felt work-wise, you know, like the the whole thing. And again, none of it is a knock on DC or Marvel. Like I, I love them and I love working there. It's not. Oh, sure. Sure. Like, but sucks over there. This is more just like, you know, there's, there's a certain level of pressure and a certain level of, um, you know, of of internal politics that you have to kind of navigate when you're there, especially if you're doing a big sizable thing where you have to convince each department it's going to benefit them in some way. And then, you know, like there's all the personalities and then there's selling it to the retailers and the fans. And it's a really, it's a, it's a wonderful, I love operating in that world, but it also like by the, by 10 years in when I was doing death metal, I was like, this is, and especially cause that was a really tough time at DC when, I think, um, you know, there was a lot of, but when I got there, because it speaks to the whole uncertainty of the comic world mm -hmm. in general, I mean, in the world, like, it's the gig economy, right? Where you're like, I came in in pre-52, New 52, I mean, and then New 52 was part of kind of the initiative where Warner Brothers had just purchased DC officially. And then a few years later, we're in there, five years later or whatever, and then AT&T purchased Warner Brothers. And then Discovery purchased Warner Brothers from AT&T, yeah, and all of that stuff does trickle down, not in terms of like they say, hey, you have to have these superheroes using a phone. It's, an, it's not like that. Or, hey, you have to mirror the movies. But the people above you that work as liaisons between, you know, Warner Brothers, DC, they're always worried about what what is expected of them. And in those 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 situations, sometimes it can be harder to push things that are that are kind of um, maybe a little bit more, a little bit more left of center in terms of what you're trying to do, like Superman with a dark side arm and long rock and roll hair, or Batman as the Lord of Death, or whatever you know, Joker dragons and the whole shebang. So that it became harder and harder to have those conversations from the 50, New Fifty Two onward. And I think by the end, it was more like it was so so sort of everyone was so worried about what AT&T and Discovery wanted and whether or not we were going to upset sort of the apple cart by doing things that would would change, you know, the characters even even for a short period of time into these like rock and roll versions and 
all that kind of stuff that it it was like i just need a break you know on the other side of this i need to re just like not stress about this anymore for a while no definitely so. not i mean because like i say the, the books stand on themselves they have such a unique energy out there that like i mean I don't want to say you can put it in a cruise control, but trust me, the, the fan reaction from ones that we talk to online and in person, everybody's really in love with the product that's coming out. I'm so glad, you know, I'm so glad. Um, I, I really, I love what we're doing and I'm, I'm really proud of it. You know, I really believe in it. So I hope people enjoy them. I think, you know, each book is, is really a passion project and I know that sounds corny. Um, but, uh, it's the truth. Like the thing that, it, um, um, I feel like the, the, uh, idea with each one was to go with a co-creator and say, give them a seed of an idea and be like, Greg, you know, why don't we do something that's like, I have this idea about what if demons are an infection based on this, like cosmic material It's the heaviest stuff in the cosmos. It's like a super heavy element. And then you fight them with the lightest stuff in the universe, atomic number zero, like a halo, you know, that that's very rare also. And there are these two, this group that's been fighting and that's it. What do you think? And, you know, do you want to do it? It'd be like demons and epic, you know, millennium old things and be a thousand blades that people have. And, and he was just like a hundred percent, let's do it. And I want it to be, let's do a young person. Let's make it generational. Let's make it about a teen character. That's like coming in, having to find their own faith in the midst of, all this turmoil and I was like great and the same with Francis with clear he was here at my house like with his um wife and daughter a couple of years ago and uh we were just hanging out and uh and we were talking about our fears for our kids and it was like you know I, I hate the fact that my teenager like everything he encounters online is algorithmically designed to kind of push him towards more of what he already likes you know which makes sense and I sales like perspective like you like this what about this like this is like that you know but when you think of it on a macro level it kind of sucks where it's like they're rarely exposed to things outside their comfort zone and then if you extend that to you know information and news and political um, viewpoints and all of it and you realize how cocooned you wind up getting if you kind of follow the arrow to the next thing it's just like the thing you already like mm -hmm. so that's where clear came from was well why don't we tell a story about that you know, what do you think if we did a sci-fi future, Francis, where everybody kind of lives in their own? Oh, I love it. Well, let's make it a murder mystery. Okay. Same ghoul was me and Francesco just talking about classic horror movies because we started watching them in the pandemic to kind of escape the daily, the daily horror of it. And um, he was like, why don't we, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there was a classic monster for today? And I was like, let's make one. And, and then the ghoul, the monster of that book is, you know, very reflective of this moment in the way that the ghoul is kind of a creature of pestilence and 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 levels empires and civilizations by releasing plagues when the civilization has become kind of rotted or bloated or that kind of thing and so it speaks to some of our fears in the air at least about this moment in time with the way we become you know about in, inability to have any discourse the divisiveness the 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 you know, hypocrisy, all of it. So that that's how each book was built. Mm -hmm. you know, Barnstormer, same thing. Canary, 100% same thing. That came from Dan and I talking about classic Westerns and how would you do a Western today? Because Westerns are so engaged with, as a as a kind of genre machine that like, there there's really very few sort of Westerns that aren't about the period in which they came in in some way, because they're so there's such an American myth-making way of thinking of ourselves. So it was like, well, how do you do one now? I'd well, have to kind of bend the genre a bit. All right, let's do it. So that um, each one is really special that way. You know, each one is like a, a really personal book. They're not just like, oh, I have this pitch. Well, who can do it? Who's free? It's not like that at all. It's really like each book is, well, do you like the seed of this idea? Okay, well, great. What's your, what's your take on it? Okay, well, let me react to that. And then back and forth. And that's why I think they're, you know, like when you do metal and that stuff, it's me and Greg making our own shit and not worrying about what fans think. Not because we don't care. I care deeply with fans. Right, right. But it, but it's more personal. I mean, this is just your labor, your ideas all coming together. So, I mean, this is more, more or less for you. And then the fans will definitely, you know, get something out of this as well. Yeah, exactly. It's like that. <clears throat> it's like making something the same way the priorities at DC were making it for yourself, hoping they love it the way you love it. It's just this one, I'm not worried 
as much about whether it's not even I worry if they love it. I mean, I, I certainly worry and want them to love it, but there isn't pressure on it the mm -hmm. way it was there where it's like, Oh, if it doesn't do well, you know, or if it doesn't sell above a hundred thousand, it could mean like, you know, people's jobs in that way. Like there's none of that, which keeps you up at night, you know, yeah. especially when you love the people you work with like that. So this is much more like, you know, just, just a lot more, a lot less stress, a lot more getting to watch baseball with my kids, even though I have more work. So. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I got a, you know, coming up fairly soon here, it's going to be time for New York Comic Con. Uh, of yeah. course, myself and Ken will both be at New York Comic Con uh, this year as well. Uh, wondering if you could share any plans that there's uh, possibly uh, happening for you at New York. Totally. Um, hang on one sec. I'm just texting my kid that I'm out here. The, um, the uh, yes, so I will be at New York Comic Con. We're going to announce our Comixology presence pretty soon. So I'm going to be doing some big stuff with them for fun again, the way we always do, like a some kind of partnership we did scott tober last year and then we did scott tober west coast out in in july and which is you know uh it's, it has its own its own logic to it but it was like out in san diego and then we're doing some special stuff this this october and they've got a lot of cool announcements to make all around with some great creators they're partnering with so i'm really thrilled well we're gonna basically in like a week or so we're gonna make a big um, push about like guess what we're doing so I, I can't quite give everything away here but I'll be there I'll be there the whole time I'll be promoting this I'll also be promoting we have Noctera coming back which I'm really excited about um, this one is just a special issue it's Val number one and it tells sort of Val's story both past and present the way we did with Blacktop Bill okay um, Francis, Francis Manipal drew it so oh nice Tony and I co-wrote it, and um, it's so it's it came out so well. I'm really proud of it. And then Noctera proper comes back in the winter with Tony. We're working on the next arc right now, but it's it's big. The next arc is like, you know, out of control. Where it's like, you know, it's sort of like aliens to aliens. So it's like giving him plenty of time to to make lots of monsters and trucks and all that kind of stuff. So that'll come out. Um, Right in the yeah in the in the heart of winter we'll we'll announce it soon but that that comes back so we'll be promoting Noctera, be promoting the Comicsology stuff, um, and yeah and the other I should know that New York, like right after New York around New York is when we find out if Witches gets the green light for the the TV stuff that we've been working on with it so if that comes through that would be I don't know that'd just be a dream I love I love. I love what we were able to do with the pitch for the show and the episodes we did. So I don't know. I've never worked in anything TV before. So this was a, a huge learning curve and I loved it. So I'm really, I don't know. I really hope, but I'll know. And I'll obviously tell fans like by New York or soon after, if we know in, in, in by end of October. So, so fingers crossed. Yeah, absolutely. We're definitely going to put the good energy out for that. But before we let you go, we got to talk a little New York baseball with you. I, I know you t you're a very big Yankees fan, as we are, too. Padawan yeah. Jay has been sitting here ready to talk some baseball with you. So, Pad? Yeah, so I've, as as Ken mentioned, you're a big Yankees fan. So are we. Uh, had, the team had a red-hot start to the season, hottest in God knows how long, and, and kind of cooled off a bit. What is your assessment of the team? Are you, are you still optimistic that they're going to do well come postseason time, or is, is the sky falling? Oh no, I'm 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 very optimistic. We've been watching the captain and seeing sort of the slumps that, that the team went through even in their you know, their dynasty years. But yeah, I mean I know I know people get like fire cashman, fire boon when things dip and certainly the slump from like August was miserable. I mean like to go from being the best team in all of baseball to having like the I think it was like the third worst record was was brutal and to lose two out of three and to lose to teams that you should you should be able to handle. And then, I mean, like yesterday was not pretty. I mean, I was not, we won five in a row and then it was not the yep. A's, took two out of four. It was We got, what, three hits total? Something was, like that. It was, pretty, it was ugly, man. It was ugly. And, and, you know, Schmidt, I love him, but I don't think he's a starting pitcher. And I think our bullpen is hurting. And the fact that our injured list right now is like, <laughs> Nestor and Chapman mm -hmm. and Britton and Abreu and uh, King and like I mean it just is and 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 and, and uh, Efra still like it's brutal I mean I don't know like I, I like to think of it as like you have to have you have to have some like 
like if it's like three act structure, like a film, yeah, like this is, it's exactly when you'd have the moment before the the climax, the third act where everybody rises up to fight. This is the all hope is lost moment where it's like, uh, what's going to happen? Like you got Toronto creeping up, you yeah. got you know the Braves and the Mets and the Astros with better records suddenly. I'm I'm a big believer though. I think I believe Judge is going to get past sixty. I believe we're going to pick it up. I don't believe in like we got a curse because of Gallo or Monty. I'm a big, oh. I'm a big, I'm a big, I don't know. I'm a big optimist. I'm a, what do you think? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm optimistic as well. You know, I, I was talking with a friend who was also a Yankees fan and, you know, they mentioned at the start of the month, you know, how, oh, what a slumber. I'm like, yeah, you figured it had to come at some point. And then, you know, three weeks later, we're still here. You know, one of the worst slumps since like the early 1900s. I'd, I saw a stat, which I couldn't believe, but no, I'm right there with you. But there's no, the weird thing is there's no reason for it. Like, yeah. That's, the thing that's so frustrating is like, I mean, Benny is, Ben and Tendi, like our trades, yes, like, like, you know, Frankie Montas was not, did not show up great, you know, the first time, but he did all right last time. And I think, hang on, what? Who are you talking to? I'm doing an interview. Oh. My kid, this is my kid, who's a huge Yankee fan himself. So nice. Nice. My 11 year old, but um you know i mean there's i think the weirdest part is like so ben and is showing up you know efros did well yes monty is doing amazing over in the cardinals and like does it suck that we traded him would i have done that no but that said like there's no reason on paper for us to be doing so badly right like, everything should be better if not the same as it was when we were red hot so gallo is gone like yeah we have a couple drags on our lineup like i love higgy but you know, yeah, I'm yeah. with you on that one. Whatever is not, and Hicks. I mean, like, I, I I feel terrible that we people boo him and follow him around, but like, you know, he gets up and it's like an automatic automatic out. You know, so I just feel like there's no reason for it to be happening. Is the thing that drives New Yorkers crazy? Like, mm-hmm. well, like it's happening. Like, what what juju or like weird psychological funk did we fall into? So. I don't know. I'm a big believer that it's just a weird phase, like a strange growing pain. Yeah. And we're going to come back and rock out on the other side and make it to the make it to the World Series. Yeah, no, I, I liked all the trades, too. You know, the Montas one, you know, I, at first I was like, wait, why? What's going on? Why is there issues? You know, he's supposed to be really good. And then I'd heard, oh, he just come off a of bereavement, like he'd lost a close family member. I'm like, oh, OK, you know, I get that. You know, yeah. Ben attendee has been great. Yeah. Ben and has been great. I mean, that's like, it took him a minute to heat up and now here he sure. is, you know, and it, like, I don't know. And I'm, a, I mean, judge to me is like, I, I do not believe that that his story goes like diminishes now. I just mm-hmm. think it's too, too close to like something historical for it to, to go. And to have somebody like that, like my kids, you should see, he's got like a cutout life-size cutout of judge in his room. And like, we got it. We got a signed ball for Christmas. That was our big thing. Was, nice. You know, we out and got it for a couple hundred bucks. And he's got like, you know, his card collection is insane. The judge is like our, you know, our, our big guy in our house. And like, ultimately, to bet on yourself. Oh, well, they can't really. Oh, we just got He's just showing me. He's oh, Grom. very we're nice. Oh. We love, we're Mets fans. That's the sleeve patch. He got a, he got a Drew Grom card yesterday. He's nice. Happy. That's so cool. But like, yeah, the, no, I, like, to end on like something that I think ties it together, the idea that like Judge was offered what most of us would be like, wow, that was that was a really good contract, and was like, no, I'm worth more, and I'm going to show it to you and everyone. I remember just being like, not like, wow, that's obnoxious, but being like, no, you know, look, I mean, it's possible he could be like Judge 2017. If that's the case, then yeah, but that's a big bet to make on yourself and to be like what if you get injured all of mm-hmm. it and suddenly like you're worth a lot less than what you were just offered. But in, now to be like a shoe in for MVP and to, to rock out, I mean, it's a great story, you know? And like, to oh, show absolutely. Kid, like, to be like this, like, you know what, like take the risk, do the thing that you think you're, you're worth, do the thing that if you have more to show, show it, you know? And that's like part of what we're all trying to do in comics right now too, is like, I think at this crazy moment when there's so much uncertainty and so much like, Cause that's the thesis and then I'll shut up about it. It's like, um, Hey honey, we just closed the door. It's getting too hot in here. The, um, yeah, no, you can't, no, you can't eat your brother's cake pop. You cannot eat that. No, I'm sorry. Will you close the thing? The, um, he's trying to get his brother's cake pop. But he can't. The, um, <laughs> the, the closing thesis for me is like, you know, the, the right now in comics is 
is is crazy scary in a lot of ways right like it is like the way the rest of the world is mm-hmm. like, you don't know like dc and marvel like i said there's less it used to be you have a day job at dc marvel and you could do your indie stuff on the side and there were exclusive contracts you know a, given out a lot more you had it you had you had security and you know you took mitigated risk now the same way like being in tv learning about tv they used to have network 24 episodes a season then syndication hopefully and residuals now with streaming you have six episodes you're guaranteed to work on it might pay more than what it paid at network to do each episode but at the end of six or eight episodes you don't know if you're going to get another season you don't know you don't you don't get residuals the way you did before because there's no syndication so the same in comics where it's like now you don't have those same safety sort of places like day job safety stuff it's more like you do whatever you can but there's so many more opportunities the same way like there's 10 times as many shows to get hired on not that i want to do tv i just this is my one thing that i did which is like learning about it like you you get you can get hired on 10 times as many things there's always more work but that work is less secure in comics there's a million ways to pick what thing fits you where they did not exist before you can kickstart you can go to a smaller company that takes half of your ancillary rights like tv film but make great partners you know you could do something totally on your own like an image you can decide you're really going to try and get into dc and marvel and even though they don't give out long contracts use that as a way to boost your profile you can do anything like you can do digital comics you can do com- com- whatever there's a million ways in now and a million ways to pick what's right for you but the key is understanding who you are what you want to make and betting big on yourself right now you know because there's no chasing like a safety thing anymore there's no like well how do i there's no there's no um conventional route the way there was before there's no like this is the way most people do it everybody's all over the place doing right. their own thing so that's what I mean. Like, it's like, be your own Aaron judge. You know what I'm saying? Like go out there and say, I'm worth it. I'm going to try something that fits me. Even if nobody else thinks that it would do it. Yep. And that's a perfect way to describe what you're doing with this line. Cause honestly, the books stand up for themselves. They are all fantastic. And I'm not saying this as somebody that is just shilling this. I'm saying as somebody that personally went out and bought a subscription has been telling everybody in earshot Go get the subscription to get these books and go to the LCS when these books come out. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Like, I, I love what you guys do with the podcast, and I feel like we're all in it together. You know what I mean? Like, all of us are just trying to find a way to spread the, like, word about how great comics are and get more people in. I mean, mm. the more we, the bigger tent we create, the healthier it'll be, whether it's digital, you know, print, whether it's DC, Marvel, Image. Like, there's no... It's not, I mean, I miss the old bullpen of like DC versus Marvel a bit. Right, but. But I mean, like, no, it's just different now. It's more like, how do we get as many people into comics as possible? And that's, that's the, that's the key. You know, that's the game. Absolutely. So that being said, in the liner notes of this podcast, we have the information to sign up for all the Comixology books, the Substack, which you should be checking out. It is highly recommended. And we got Scott's Twitter handle in there as well. Scott. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to talk some comics with us. We'd love to do it again sometime. No, anytime, man. This was a pleasure. Yeah, let's do it again soon. Absolutely. we Will do. Rich, thank you for coming on the show, doing the guest hosting duty. Where can we find you? Uh, you go to uh, 3FNpodcast.com. Get all the information listed there. And, and thank you, Scott, for talking to us again as well. And for the one and only Padawan Jay. Thank Sorry you. my kid came in being like, can I eat my little brother's cake pop thing in the middle? But... This is dadding on the side. No, nah, no worries at all. Yeah, no, no, we that, we can edit out, so don't worry about that at all. No, you you can leave it in. Oh, okay, there you go. Sorry, interruption, but anyway, <laughs> all right. I'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah, thanks very much. All right, thanks, Scott. Appreciate you it. Got it. Bye. Bye. The links to get all of these books are in the liner notes of this episode, and the whole team here cannot thank Scott Steiner enough for taking time out of his day to talk to us about these fantastic comics. I can't stress enough. You need to sign up for the deals to get this. You need to go to your local comic shops, get the print version is something that is so much of an investment. You can't even comprehend. These books are absolutely fantastic. Thank you again for listening to this special edition of the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We'll see you next time.